Parker, expected approach time 34, approach button 17, the altimeter 29 or 9 or 7. Welcome back to the DCS Situation Report and the channel, everyone. I hope this video finds you well. I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog, and here we are once again talking about a brand new module coming to the DCS world environment, and this is the A1 Sky Raider, which really almost needs no introduction, but once again, in what I'm calling the summer of submissions from Eagle Dynamics, thanks to a number of maps and aircraft popping up like mushrooms, that bombarded us with yet another module in which to contemplate what to do with. Now, the official third-party developer is Crosstail Studios, who I'm not all that familiar with, who are going to be, I guess, new to all of us, and the announcement itself, which was foreshadowed by Cuban Ace, and that came as something of a surprise. Naturally, there was a flurry of speculation as to what aircraft was actually going to be released, whether it was a map or whether it was both a map and an aircraft. So congratulations to those of you who guessed correctly, because some of you said, I'd like a Sky Raider to go with the future Vietnam map. Well, we certainly have one half of that, and that is this awesome looking Sky Raider. Now, many of you, of course, will be familiar with this aircraft, which served with the U.S. Navy, Marines, and the Air Force, and it is a monster of a fighter bomber, and it served in both Korea and Vietnam, just missing out, really, towards the end of World War II to be fully deployed as a replacement for aircraft being used at the time. Now, according to ED's brief, the Crosstail team have had access to airworthy examples of the Sky Raider, thanks to the Kavanaugh Flight Museum, which is based in Texas. Now, the aim here, of course, is to try and recreate the most authentic virtual example of this famous and historically important attack plane, which is also a personal favorite of mine. I should mention here my other favorite, probably my all-time favorite prop aircraft of the era is the Hawker Typhoon, which was also a ground attack aircraft and did pretty well after a bit of a tricky start. That's another aircraft I'd love to see in the game too. Now, in addition to help from the museum, the Sky Raider veterans community is also lending support thanks to the A1 Sky Raider Association. Expect then a lot of input from that community, which I must say probably provides a little pressure on the developers to really get this aircraft right. Nevertheless, I think the community enjoys input from real pilots to embellish their virtual ex uh, flying experiences. There are some core of us out there who do try to fly these as realistically as we can within the constraints of the information that is available to us and, of course, what DCS can actually provide, and that is also part of the fun. Now, while this is a capable ground attack aircraft, the plane performed a lot of search and rescue missions, a role it really excelled at. Now, in many respects, a prop aircraft of the era almost seems incongruent to the rise of the jet engine and aircraft were flying faster than ever before, really superseding the reliance we had on prop planes in military and commercial aviation particularly. But it has been said uh, that in many respects the aircraft was anachronistic flying in the jet age of modern combat, but it found a niche that uh, other aircraft couldn't perform as well. And uh, similar to the hog today, uh, it's quite a difficult aircraft to replace, even though there are uh, reasons to do so. So it, as I said, it picked up a little bit of a niche and became famous for that. Obviously, its strength was the enormous payload that it could carry. In fact, it could actually carry more than it weighed, along with a long loitered time and endurance times in general, being able to fly in some cases, depending on the configuration, up to 10 hours. So it's a pretty cool aircraft for that. And again, that lent itself to pretty flexible mission briefs as described. 
So congratulations to the Crosstail Studios team for bringing us another tail-dragging aircraft to get to grips with. They've also partnered with uh, Echo Niner Audio Production, who many of you will also be familiar with, and they are going to be doing the sounds for the aircraft, and that will be a real immersive treat. So looking forward to see how that comes to fruition in the game as usual. No word yet on whether we'll see the release of a Vietnam map to accompany the plane, or if there are independent plans to produce that. We know we've had some hints, so stay tuned on that matter. In a recent survey I conducted, about 50% of you, and I forget how many people voted in the end, it was well over 500, but uh, thank you for doing that. About 50% of you voted for production of a Vietnam map, and I don't think there's any doubt about what the community is looking for if ED is paying attention, which I know they are. So let me know what you think about this revelation on the Sky Raider in the comments section below, and of course, whether it needs that Vietnam map to go with it, please, ED. Stick around, we'll see what happens. Break away, break away, break away. Contact. You're taking fuel. I would be remiss if I did not mention the fact that Split Air released their independent module this week, the Bronco, which is a free module to play. Now, you can find more information on their Discord channel about the aircraft, which is still a work in progress. Like the Sky Raider, this is also a prop-driven plane and also provided troop support in Vietnam, close support, and also reconnaissance roles. Uh, it actually had two engines over the one, and while it was not as heavy duty as the Sky Raider and didn't carry the same firepower of its heavily armored partner, Nonetheless, it was a very useful support, and it's an interesting little aircraft. It's not yet an official DCS product, of course. As I said, it is just a mod. Like many of the other free modules out there, like the Skyhawk and uh, the UH-60 mod, uh, it's, uh, it's quite well done, and I'm looking forward to seeing more work being done on this. There are working guns and some other ordnance, I believe, and my early flight experiences with it were pretty pleasant. It's a great aircraft to just go cruising around in and do some sightseeing because it has a nice little cockpit while also giving you the opportunity to switch into some combat roles and maybe blow something up. You know, that's what we what we enjoy about DCS World. So I'm looking forward to seeing further development on this aircraft in the future. They're already compiling a list of early bugs, so the feedback from the community is pretty positive at this time. And it's this kind of module with the right support from the community, which continues to expand and show a great hunger for broader mission aircraft. It really is something that I could see maybe evolving into a commercial product down the line. So stay tuned and support the team. You can actually go over to the Discord, give them a wave, give them a, a thumbs up if you like the product and what the uh, what work they're doing on the product. Uh, so go visit them online, let, you, let, let them know what you think, or, or you can drop them a line in the comment section below. Now, another ED news work continues on the supercarrier, including the PriFly briefing room, where virtual squadrons can conduct pre-flight meetings and briefings, including sharing information across tablets and also being able to use the projector. This is really, really cool. Uh, it's a choice bit of information and immersion realism that I really appreciate from ED. So uh, obviously with the Air Warfare Group, we're about to embark on a pretty extensive training mission with the Syria map on a, on a basically an extended cruise here. So this kind of thing would be really useful as a, again, an immersion experience for a, a virtual squadron. So again, I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, ED does with this, how this will be able to be implemented uh, in a virtual squadron situation. It's a neat little touch and yeah, we'll have to see how things progress on that. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Well, hello there. Now, ED also announced a major injection of coding logic into the AI BFM model, which will now be much more realistic. AI aircraft types will favor a suitable turn circle type or combination, meaning the tactical responses from the AI will differ between the airframes. Now, the AI will now try to dictate turning room based on aspect angles and energy states. A one circle fighter will try to minimize turning room, whereas a two circle fighter will try to get an offset angle and a shot across the tail. Now, the skill of the AI level will dictate how well the AI manages G and energy, which should provide more variety and realism when encountering AI opponents in set missions or future and some current campaigns. Now, interestingly enough, Reflected Simulations published a video recently about the constant monitoring and updates that he does to make sure that his campaigns keep pace with these kinds of changes in the core engine or changes which can, of course, influence AI behavior. 
Now, this, I suspect, could make a very big difference to campaigns with an emphasis on air-to-air combat, say, for example, the red flag type exercises, or again, where there is uh, an emphasis on air-to-air com- combat. Uh, this is less likely to affect right now the World War II stuff, so don't expect any changes there at this time, but this primarily is referencing the uh, jet aircraft that we have. And I find, uh, when thinking about this, is this is a pretty intriguing and exciting tweak that has, of course, long been asked for and part of many other changes that are ongoing to AI behavior in the sim that I hope we'll see continue. Uh, I think also it could be a little bit more of a useful exercise for For those pilots not wanting to get into human BFM combat for whatever reason, because a lot of players are predominantly solo, and this is going to, again, provide some much more realistic experiences, I think, Um, behavior that you can probably mimic yourself or see uh, some examples of of how uh, an opponent would would behave in a more realistic fashion. So it'll be interesting to see again uh, how this is implemented and what it looks like in game. I'm looking looking forward to it. What altitude are you pulling out from the gun? At about 50. Okay. And off target, let's see. Now switching back here to Razbam, who have continued to show progress on the F-15E, which a lot of you are demanding to be released this year and that is the plan according to Razbam, at least in the uh, earlier part of this year and the shots that they showcased this week show some of the flexibility of the air-to-ground radar and it's pretty obvious to me that this aircraft is going to dominate in this area it won't be the same experience as some of the other aircraft that we have including the sky radar which is uh, more of a close support aircraft in the in the uh, fashion that was more like World War II, where it was much lower to the ground uh, and uh, more of a knife fight type stuff. But it's not exactly a fair comparison across the areas here, but nonetheless, it will be a satisfying aircraft to uh, uh, get to grips with and to use that kind of firepower from on high, especially if you're going to fly with a friend or in a squadron situation. I think it's going to be a really fun aircraft. So hopefully Razbam can keep... uh, throwing these images up and hopefully we'll get uh, more of a clue about whether this aircraft is going to be released here this year because uh, the end of the year is marching on. We don't have a lot of time left, Razbam, so uh, I hope you're listening out there because uh, the communities, uh, we still got our fingers crossed. We're, we're hoping for the F-15E this year. I think this brings us to the end of another soup wrap. Just a short one this week. It's been a busy week keeping abreast of all these changes and a busy week for me in general. Uh, and exciting, I guess, in some ways, WAGS hinted uh, that prior to the Sky Raider, there are four more announcements to make this year. Uh, three, I guess now, if we scratch the Sky Raider from the list. So lots of speculation out there as to what those aircraft or modules or whatever the heck they will be as additions to the game. And it sounds like it's going to be third-party products as well. So again, exciting times. Let me know what you think of today's topics the good or the bad, uh, whether you think it's good or bad. I know there are some grumblings about all the good news on modules and maps taking away from what some people think should be ED's core business, and that is bug fixing and stabilization of the core game. That does have some legitimacy, uh, but I think it's also important to remember that not all of these maps are um, influencing or taking away from that because they're third-party products. So it's not like ED is uh, distracted by... Uh, the implementation of these necessarily in a way that influences uh, or impacts their ability to still do the core business. I like to keep a broader fix here and would suggest that the breadth of developers infiltrating the sim indicates viability with the product, for starters, because now you have people who are willing to make products for DCS World, and this year has been particularly uh, buoyant for that. And hopefully then the additional revenue will provide ED with continued and more resources to flow back into the core features. And maybe I'm just overly optimistic or maybe I'm naive, but that's one angle that I look at it. If it's managed correctly, of course. And uh, I know people have different opinions on that. Anyway, hopefully what it means is we can have our Sky Radar Vietnam map and core features too. We'll see. Well, thanks again for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. 
will support the channel through the super thanks button. I appreciate that. It really helps the channel chug along. One of the things I'm really aiming for this year, and it's really going to help the channel chug along a little bit further, is the aim for 10,000 subscribers. Obviously, we're starting to run out of time. I know about 50% of you are subscribers. I think it'll be a challenge to hit 10,000. And uh, while I will be disappointed, um, it's not the end of the world because I don't want to grow the channel too fast in terms of my ability to manage it. But 10,000 is the aim. That will really boost the channel and uh, just give me a little bit more um, hope for viability and the future of the channel and will also provide me with a little bit more flexibility in terms of the things that I can do right now, which uh, my wife questions on a daily basis sometimes how much time I'm spending reading uh, flying, and uh, this is my other basically full-time job. I'm spending quite a lot of time on this. The remuneration uh, isn't great, so uh, it's a it's a labor of love, and I enjoy this product, and I enjoy doing these videos. Uh, I get a kick out of it, and I hope you do too. So we'll see you next time on the DCS Situation Report. This is Prickly Hedgehog out for another week. We'll see you next time. Cheers.